Hello again and welcome to introdu Introduction to Experimental Psychology, Psych 224. So this is session 10 of this course and this is part 1 of session 10. So in the previous sessions I've talked a lot about experimental research designs, I have spoken about extraneous variables and how to control them and I've also spoken about non-experimental research designs. Now I'm moving on to something slightly different but also very important in experimental psychology which is ethics in psychological research. So doing research in psychology is usually governed by a set of guidelines or a set of ethical guidelines that the researcher would have to follow in conducting the research. So as a psychologist you have to be familiar with these ethical guidelines so that you'll be able to follow them when you are conducting research. Basically, it's to ensure the dignity and welfare of the participants who are being tested. So the ethics govern the use of human participants in research as well as animal subjects in research. So we have the APA, which I'm sure you know what this is. That is the American Psychological Association regulations and standards for conducting psychological research. So by the end of this study, you should be able to explain what ethics in human, in research mean. You should be able to explain why it is important to consider ethical issues when you are designing and conducting a research. And also outline the guidelines that govern the use of human participants in research. So I'll talk about why ethics in psychological research and then ethic, ethical guidelines in research with human participants. Let's start. But before then you have your reading list which as always I encourage you to take these books and read the pages that I have specified. So why ethics in psychological research? According to Christensen 2007, research ethics are a set of guidelines to assist the experimenter in conducting ethical research. So a psychologist must conduct the research in an ethical manner. You have to do it in such a way that you don't harm the human participants that you are testing. And as I mentioned earlier on, you have to ensure that you maintain the welfare and the dignity of the participants that you are testing. So that is what these research guidelines cover. So ethical principles in the conduct of research involving human participants was first published in 1953. And over the years, these, have been, this, these guidelines have been revised. So presently, we have the APA Code of Ethics 2012. But I'll refer to the 2002 because the 2012 just makes a few amendments to the Code of Ethics. So I'll base this lecture on the APA Code of Conduct, Code of Ethics 2002, which is Section 8 of the APA Code. So the significant issues in this Section 8 are institutional approval, informed consent, deception, debate debriefing, coercion and freedom to decline participation, anonymity and confidentiality, and finally removing harmful consequences. So these are what I'm going to be discussing with you. So the ethical guidelines in research with human participants, what I have previously mentioned on the previous slide. So the first one is institutional approval. Usually when you are doing research, you need an institution's approval to conduct the research. So most institutions have what you call the Institutional Review Board, the IRB for short. They are the ones who assess your research proposal before <coughs> you are given approval to conduct the research. So usually what happens is that you present a proposal 
Remember, you are proposing to do the research, so it's, you write it in the proposal form. You write it in future tense. This is what I want to do. These are the participants I want to test, and this is how I want to test them. So that is your research proposal. And then any other materials that you will use, for instance, the consent form that participants will sign, or the questionnaires you give to participants, or the tasks you give to participants to perform, or the passage they'll read, etc., etc. You add all those to your research proposal, and then you present it to the IRB, who will assess these documents and then approve your research. Sometimes they may ask you to change a few things and then they approve the research. So if you notice, I've put a link on this um, slide. And this is the link for the Ethics Committee for the University of Ghana. So here at the University of Ghana, we have several IRBs or ethic committees. And I've listed them on this slide. So for instance, I belong to the College of Humanities. So if I'm conducting research, I have to apply to the Ethics Committee for the Humanities for approval. And again, it depends on what research you are doing. You are doing. That will determine where you apply for research. And for, it depends on the kind of research you are doing. That will determine where you apply for ethics approval. So for instance, Recently, I've put in a proposal, I've put in an application to do research with people with diabetes. So I had approval from the Ethics Committee for the Humanities. But because these are patients that I'm going to recruit from the hospital, I've had to go to Ghana Health Service for them to give me ethics approval as well. When I obtain this ethics approval from Ghana Health Service, then I have to go to the original office for them to give me a letter to give to the various hospitals to permit me to test the patients in the hospitals. So depending on what your area of research is, depending on the participants you are testing, that will determine where you obtain ethics approval from. Again, whether you are testing humans or animals, that will determine where you obtain approval from. So as I mentioned, you present all the documents you are going to use to conduct your research and then you seek approval. If you receive ethics approval, then you have to conduct a study according to how you propose to conduct it. Which means that if you decide to change the way you are going to conduct your study, you have to go back to the ethics committee and do what you call, we call an amendment. So let's say I said I was going to administer questionnaires. I, I'm going to post them to participants, but I notice that when I post the questionnaires, I don't get them back. So this time, I want to go to the hospital and sit with the participants for them to complete the questionnaires. I have changed the procedure I'm going to use to collect data. So in this case, I have to apply back to ethics and say, I want to amend my procedure, and then they will give me approval or not. So that's the first ethical guideline. The second one is informed consent. And basically, this is about fully informing participants about the study you are conducting so that the participants can make an informed decision as to whether, whether they want to take part or not. So with the prospective participants, you tell them all about the study. This is what I'm trying to find out. This is how I want to find. This is the procedure. I'm going to complete a questionnaire. Or I'm going to measure your pulse rate and your heartbeat, etc and it's going to take one hour for me to do all of this. Are you interested in taking part? So you tell the participants all about the study, and then if they agree, you give them what you call a consent form to sign. For those who cannot sign, they term print. Nadia, we can have what we call active consent. So where the participants sign or term print the consent form is referred to as they giving active consent, but sometimes we may have to obtain consent from the parents or legal guardians of minors. So you have a five-year-old you want to test, a 10-year-old you want to test. Because these are minors, you may seek the consent of their parents before testing them. There are instances also where the psychologist would seek, will obtain what you call passive consent. 
And usually a psychologist will use passive consent if they want to obtain more participants or increase participation. So what this means is that you would give out a letter to those that you want to, the prospective participants. And instead of saying, if you want to take part, please sign this form. You will say, if you don't want to take part, then sign this form. Now, if you look at it, it's likely that people, people may not want to take part, but they, will, they may forget to sign the form, or they may not really think about signing the form. So the deadline you give them passes, they don't sign the form to say, I don't want to take part. So you assume that all those who didn't sign the form are those who want to take part. And so you test them. So if you go to the individual, you say, because you didn't say you don't want to take part, I consider that you want to take part. That is what we call passive consent. And we use that to increase participation. Sometimes also the psychologist may choose to dispense with informed consent. So there are situations where you don't have to obtain informed consent. So let's say you're observing the use of seat belts as a motorist drive. So you are sit standing somewhere by the roadside or sitting. And as the vehicles pass, you observe those in private cars, those in commercial vehicles, who are those more likely to put on their seat belts. In this case, you don't have to stop the people and say, I'm observing you. So you just dispense with informed consent. You don't ask them, can I observe you as you drive? You just sit and then you observe. The third one is deception. So I mentioned deception when I talked about controlling participant effects. And I mentioned that in deception, you tell the participants you are studying one thing while in fact you are studying something else. So when you use deception, either you give the participants a wrong information about the hypothesis of the study or you choose to ob omit some vital information about the study. Or because perhaps if you explain it to the participants, it's too so technical that they may not be able to understand and give their consent. Or perhaps it will let them form a certain impression about the study and affect the responses that they make. So before you use deception, you have to prove that there's no other alternative other than deception to be able to conduct your study effectively. So we can have what you call deception by commission or active deception, where the psychologist will mislead the participant about the hypothesis of the study. We can also have deception by om omission, where you would withhold certain vital information about the research. But one thing is once that study is over, you have to tell the participants that you use deception and explain to them the reason why you use deception. Another guideline is debriefing. So this talks about the fact that once you have collected your data, once you have conducted your study as a psychologist, you have to provide the participants with detailed information about the nature of the research. So especially where you use deception, you have to tell the participants that you use deception. That's the reason why you use deception. You also do debriefing so that you, you remove any misconceptions that may have arisen when you were conducting the research. Now note the difference. You have informed consent where you tell the participants about the study before they take part. And then you have debriefing, which you do after the, the participants have taken part in the study. Quite often, students confuse debriefing with informed consent. So students will say debriefing is when you inform participants about the study. No, you do that after the study. You don't do that before. That is why it is called debriefing. So please take note. Then we have coercion and freedom to decline participation. So. I mentioned in the previous session that participants are not to be forced to take part in a study. So prospective participants must, must not be coerced. You shouldn't force them to be part of a study. Tell them about the study and ask them if they want to take part. They have the freedom to decide to take part or to decline participation. So it's an ethical as a researcher to use your authority to exploit participants. So Let's say I'm a, I'm a lecturer, I want to conduct a study, and I tell my students, everybody must complete this questionnaire. And when you complete the questionnaire, I will take down your index number because I want to know those who, 
completed the questionnaire and those who did not. I'm using my position to exploit the students. I have to give them the freedom to decide whether to take part or not. But sometimes participants may think that if they don't respond or if they don't take part in the study, they'll be penalized. So they are forced to take part in the study. Again, for instance, if a doctor is doing a study and at the end of consultation, he says to the patient, can you take this questionnaire and complete for me? The patient may feel compelled to take part because he or she may think, if I say no, the next time I come, this doctor would not pay very good attention to me. So that is coercion and freedom to decline participation. Let me just add that even when participants have decided to be part of a study, they can choose to say in the middle of it that I've had enough, I don't want to continue with it. So they will withdraw from the study. They can also complete the study and say, actually I've completed the study, but I want my data to be withdrawn from the data that you have collected. So I don't want my information to be part of what you are going to analyze. Another of the guidelines is anonymity and confidentiality. So the privacy of the participants should not be violated when they are part of a research. And this involves maintaining anonymity and, the confid and confidentiality. So anonymity is about concealing the identity of the participants so that they are not, whatever information they give out is not related to the identity. So whatever information the participants give out, we cannot identify them with that information. That is why when we are doing research, we would use code numbers instead of the participants' names. We say participant one, participant two, participant 101, etc. So that we don't give away the identity and what they say. Again, whatever information we obtain from participants should be confidential. So we should keep it confidential. The researcher should just keep it amongst the research team. If a participant tells you something in the course of a study, you don't have to go around broadcasting it. You have to, and usually when you take informed consent, you, are, you assure the participant of confidentiality and you make sure that you uphold that. However, there's a limit to confidentiality and this you have to make participants aware of. So for instance, the law does not protect um, against confidentially keeping information. What it means is that the law can demand whatever information you obtained whilst you were doing the study. With that one, you cannot say you will not release the information. So when you assure participants of confidentiality, you warn them about this as well that the law does not provide protection for confidentiality of research data. Then finally, we have removing harmful consequences. So any harm or any risks that participants have been put at during the conduct of the study, it is the responsibility of the psychologist to, re to detect this harm or this co uh, negative consequence and remove it. So if in the course of, let's, let's say, interviewing a participant who attempted suicide, the participant becomes distressed. It is your duty as a psychologist to detect this distress and remove this distress. Individual to a psychotherapist or wherever the individual may obtain help, you refer the person. So it's your duty to detect any harm that has been caused and remove it. Sometimes in cases where treatment has been withheld from one group of participants, if this treatment is beneficial, you ensure that the, that group that treatment was withheld from received that treatment. So let's say we run a um, stress management program. We have an experimental group and a control group. And we notice that for the group of hypertensives who had the stress management, it improved their blood pressure levels. At the end of the study, we have to go back and give the same stress management to the control group so that they will also benefit from this positive treatment. So this brings us to the end of the ethical guidelines for the use of human participants in research.